course, we're going to be exploring MTA bus speeds data and performance data sets. We'll be using Python's pandas library to data analysis and then Altair library for data visualization and Streamlit library for creating websites. Um, by the end of this course, hopefully you'll all be able to use Python to process and analyze our open data sets and create basic web pages to visualize them. Um, one thing to note, please, please, this is important that you have all completed uh, the setups steps in the GitHub repo. I will send a link in the chat box. If you guys haven't done that, please check the readme in the repo um, and follow the steps before we you guys head on over with us. And one thing to note that this session might be a little bit too quick um, because of time constraint. So um, this notebook will have all the information and examples for you to always reference either during or after the session has ended. Great, so let's do introduction of our team. First off will be Lisa. Hey everybody, my name is Lisa Fiedler. I lead MTA's open data work. I'm really excited to have us be participating in our second open data week session of the year. Um, I also want to give a shout out to some people behind the scenes that are making this happen. So my colleagues, Jonathan and Wayne Yee, who will be helping monitor the chat box throughout this. So if you get stuck on specific steps, need help with installation, just shoot us a message in the meeting chat and we'll try our best to help you. But as Renuma said, we are going to move pretty quickly. And so if you fall behind, no worries. Like just follow along with as much as you can with what her and Dan are sharing. And I hope that you get something out of this and are able to better use our data. Thanks, Renuma. Thank you, Lisa. Um, hi, my name is Renuma Taranum. Um, I am currently a grad student at NYU. I started to work with MTA um, January of last year, so it's been about a year and a half. Um, I started to work with the MTA data and analytics reporting team, where I've done some um, developing to the public's uh, dashboard or metrics.mta.info. Um, I've also worked on, on open data and open data portal, building queries to like update any old data sets, which we'll be going over today. Um, next off, Dan. Hi, uh, I'm Dan Bowers. I work as a senior data scientist in the data and analytics team at MTA, also on the reporting team like Renuma. Uh, I joined in October, 2023 and uh, mainly work on um, internal and external data visualizations like a uh, using Python, like the maintenance of the external website. Cool, so let's go over to our section two. Um, so one thing to note that uh, we're using Python's Streamlit library to create this public metrics dashboard. This library helps us to see how the Python script translates to what you see in your web browser. So without a further ado, let's go on to VS Code. And you guys all should have your zip file in your downloads folder. So all you can do is um, add folder or open folder. And then this should show up on the left-hand side of your Explorer tab. And so to go over some of the folders that we have here, um, and the, we'll be focusing on the pages directory where it has two individual scripts and the main script, which is in the top level directory. Uh, here it's called app.py. By running the script in the top level directory, uh, you can create a multi-page app. And in order to do that, you can go to, my VS code just disappeared. No worries. Uh, so while you're getting that pulled up, Renuma, I think we're having a few messages in the chat that some people don't have VS Code in their Anaconda installation. So if you don't and you are more familiar with another IDE, feel free to use that. I think we just recommended VS Code, especially for newbies, so that you could have the same setup that we do as we're sharing our screens. And also a little background of our um, 
metric sites, as Renuba mentioned, that is built in the same tools that we'll be using here. So I'll drop another link into the chat if you want to explore that. Um, the site is built entirely in Python and it relies heavily on the Streamlit package. So actually, Jonathan or Wayne, if you could drop a link to the metric site in the chat and then also the Streamlit documentation, I think that would be helpful as well. I, I was able to get it. Uh, I just had to re-download it. Let me share it again. Sorry, guys. Quick troubleshooting. Um, but here we have the website, uh, the VS code. And then all you do is go to add folder to workspace and then add the downloaded zip file from the GitHub repo. And this should pull up um, on the Explorer tab. And then right where we, we were at um, running the Streamlit app. So go to new terminal and then you type Streamlit run and your top level directory in this case is app file. And then this should open up your web browser with the individual scripts that you see it shows up as like uh, its own page in the website. Um, great, so let us go over to one of the pages for today's session. We'll be going over bus speeds and um, you can go to the pages directory and click on bus speeds.py. And great, so one thing to note that a uh, Python script um, each of these lines is a Python command that can be executed in sequence. So you can execute each line by highlighting and hit shift return for Mac and shift enter for Windows users. You can also highlight all and then shift return again. This will open up a new terminal to run and execute the lines. Next up is a cool thing about Streamlit is you can make things show up on your screen when you're using a website and they are interactive. So some of the functions make text, which can help website look nice and easy to read. Um, let's go over to our first task, um, which is to write the title. And in order to do so, you simply um, write st.title and parentheses with quotes, um, you want to put your text in quotes because the computer knows that it should not try to interpret the text as a variable name or some other programming construct, but rather treat it as a little string of characters. Um, okay, so let's write a title. We can write visualizing MTA bus speed data. And you want to hit Command S, or you can go file and then save. And you can see here that it tells you if you want to rerun or always rerun. This helps to refresh your web page every time you hit Command S. I, I would recommend to hit always rerun so that every time you save your file, it will automatically update. Let's go over to the next um, task, which is to write the header. You simply do st.header. And same thing, um, you put your text in quotes. And let's write using Python and string. And if you hit Command S, and voila, you see it shows up on your screen right away. Cool. And the next task would be to write a block of text. So you can do st write. Same thing with codes. Um, this basically helps you um, to write multiple sentences in one block. Um, so for example, you can write bus data is calculated by dividing total mileage over total operating time. And you hit Command S and it shows up on your screen. Um, another thing to note about this is uh, instead of writing uh, a long sentence to the right, you can just simply click on return and then add your another sentence. Let's say distance 
and time is measured for each bus route during peak and off peak hours. And hit Command S, and there you go, it shows up. So that's like a cool way to make your website look nice uh, with text. Um, next thing, it would be to pull in your data. Um, so we're pulling, so MTA data can be found on the open data portal. In order to do that, just go to data.ny.gov and search for MTA bus speed. Um, for today's demonstration, we're using 2020 and onwards. And click on the link. And then in order to pull the data, you have to go to export, click on export on your right-hand side and hover your cursor to CSV and right-click and then copy link address. And then you can just paste your address in the data URL. Um, another, that's one way. Another way is that using an API, which is an application programming interface and you just also copy either if you want a JSON or CSV, copy it and then paste it the same way. Um, you can also do that. But today's lesson will be going over the first method. And this all is in the notebook if you want to uh, have it for reference. And so um, now you want to read the data in pandas. So in order to transform into a pandas data frame, you use pd.read um, CSV method, uh, which is uh, which transforms the data into pandas data frame. So you can easily filter, group, aggregate, visualize the data using pandas functions and methods. Great. So um, next thing is to checking the types of data. Um, so in order to do that, you use D types. D types of a data frame tells you what type of data each column has. So if there are different types of column, different different types in a column, then it will be shown as an object. So let's execute the line using shift return. And this tells you here, it prints you all the columns on the left side and um, what D type they are. You can see D type is an integer. Um, total mileage is a float, uh, operating time integer, and average speed is a float. And float means basically it's in decimal form. Great. Um, and another cool functionality of Streamlit is you can print um, any data frame to your web browser. Um, in order to do that, you simply write st.dataframe and add in your data. Hit Command S, and there you go. It shows you your data frame in the website. Great. Um, next thing on which you see here is um, using the filter options for uh, Streamlit filter options. You can see in the website that we have this um, drop down menu. To go over briefly, you'll just be using Streamlit and it select box to create a drop down menu. Um, we'll be going over all of the filtering and the chart um, uh, in the last section. Uh, don't worry about that. And let's focus on Pandas library. Um, here, we're checking the type of data in the date column. You want to make sure your date column is in date time object in order to perform filtering options based on your specific data range. So here, basically, you're using type method to retrieve what type of uh, class type it is, IATs to specify the index. And in this case, we're specifying it to zero, which is the first row. Uh, and we're saying to check the first row of the month column. So let's execute that, shift return, and, oh, Sorry, ship return. Okay, so here you see it shows up as class string, meaning that the data type of the value is a string. And this is not what we want. We want it as a date time object. 
So in order to do that, we use PD to date time um, in order to transform the elements of month column into a date time object. And then you use arg equal to specify the argument being passed. In this case, it's the month column format is to um, tell the function how to interpret the string. And we want it in year dash month value. And then dt dot date is an accessor that extracts only the date portion of the date time object and assigning it back to the month column. This um, all is described with explanations and examples in the notebook section. So now if you copy and paste and run this shift return, you see that now the month column is in date time object. Great, so it looks like everything's working good. Um, here, this is also another filtering of um, the date using st.date input, which you'll go over in section four. Um, and then dot loc is to apply all the filters, which will also go into the section four. Um, now task number six is group by. Um, so group by operation can be used to group large amounts of data in a data frame based on one or more columns and then apply it into uh, each group. So in this case, we're using group by um, to the group um, DF filter data frame right here and by the month column. So, and the AGG function is applied to each group in this case. Uh, we're calculating the total sum of total mileage and sum of total operating time um, for each month. And then as index is basically to make sure your month is a column rather than an index. And yeah, and then we're calculating the average speed uh, by dividing the total mileage and the total operating time for each month. And then we are creating a new column called average speed in that data frame. Great, and this one I'll go over briefly is that uh, why are we pulling um, a maximum average speed and then why are we adding 20%? So we're getting a Y maximum for our chart by finding the maximum average speed values and adding 20% to it because adding 20% to the maximum average speed allows the charts um, y-axis to have a little extra room at the top, making it easier to see the data points and providing more context for the data pre being presented. It is a common practice to add some padding to the axis limits to ensure that the data is not squished to the bottom um, or the top uh, of the chart, which can make it harder to read and interpret. So that's why we're adding 20%. Um, next thing is to rename columns. Uh, we're using dot rename any, and then the column parameters lets you rename the column directly. And then lastly, it's the chart. Um, this code creates a chart that allows the average speed of buses in a specific location over a certain period of time using Pandas library called Altair, right here, ALT. And the chart displays the dates um, on the x-axis and um, the average speed in miles per hour in the y-axis. Um, and then we're setting y-axis minimum to a zero. And then when you hover, you should be able to see the date and average speed for that date. And the code also um, includes a title that displays um, the name of the location you see here, Bronx, if you were to change Manhattan, it's going to change into Manhattan. Um, and then the date range of the data being shown. And finally, we're using Streamlit to display the chart in a web page. So that's our end of section three. Now I'll hand, or, hand it over to Dan for the final section. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Renuma. Um, I'll bring up the page now, share screen, screen one. 
Okay, um, so the page I'll be going over is called the uh, bus underscore CJFM in the, um, if you have Streamlit open or VS Code open and are following along uh, in the browser, uh, it's the bus customer journey time performance page. Um, in this section, I'll go over how you can use um, different Streamlit commands to accept user input modify the data sets that you read in uh, based on that input, um, create visualizations of those data sets uh, using the Altair package, um, and use Streamlit functions to organize the layout of your page in a way that's more friendly to users. So, uh, are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll wait for, for this. Sorry guys, it's fire drill day today at the MTA, which is a great time. <laughs> okay, um, so getting back into it, uh, we'll be exploring uh, customer journey time performance data. Um, this data set uh, reflects information on uh, the rider's experience and performance metrics that buses use to measure the rider's experience as people use buses. Um, We'll also be reading in a data set from the open data portal, uh, like Renuma showed before. Um, I'll begin by uh, displaying that data set as we go over some of the important columns we'll be working with. So uh, like Renuma showed, I'll type st.dataframe and then bus journey, which is the uh, name of the data set I'm assigning this to, and then hit the rerun button in the top to rerun the page. Um, so as we look at this, we can see that each row in this data set is information over a month for a given route at a given time of day, off peak or peak, uh, on a given uh, trip type. Uh, so express, local, uh, SBS. And then the metrics that are shown in this data set are the number of riders on that route at that time period over that month, the average additional bus stop time, which is the average time that customers wait at a stop beyond the time that they're scheduled to wait, the additional travel time, which is the average time customers spend on board a bus beyond their scheduled travel time, and the customer journey time performance, which is the percentage of customers whose journeys are completed within five minutes of the scheduled time. So uh, looking at sort of the rest of this page, you can see uh, there's a number of different filters here. Um, there's uh, view of the data set after those filters are applied. There's a line chart, which has some problems with it. And then there's a bar chart, which also has some problems with it. So the goal of this session or throughout the session, uh, we'll be completing the tasks in this uh, script to organize these filters in a more logical way and to organize the data set and charts in a more logical way um, and fix the problems in each of those. So. I'll comment out the ST data frame statement um, and then start working from, through some of these filters. Um, and I, I should also mention uh, here, um, using st.markdown as another text input, uh, you can um, apply additional styling to your text using uh, the markdown syntax, which I, I won't go too much into, but is a pretty uh, basic format for writing documents. So um, then getting into this script, uh, like Renuma went through um, here, we are converting the month column in this data set, uh, which has also been read in as a string to a date by using the pandas state to date time function and specifying the format. Um, we're then extracting the maximum and minimum month uh, from that. And in this date input here, we're showing uh, as the minimum value or the starting point for the date range that's shown, the minimum month and the maximum month as the maximum month and setting uh, restrictions on the range you can select, uh, like this arrow is grayed out uh, based on the maximum and minimum month that's in the data frame. Um, if you left uh, just an individual month here, um, which I'll, I'll do quickly, even though it'll break the page, um, this turns into a, a single date select. So if your page, you just wanted someone to be able to select one date, 
uh, you just provide one value there. If you provide two, it converts to a range. Um, so one concept that's useful to understand is uh, streamlet functions are translating things to your browser. And then some, some of them, uh, the input functions, are also returning values to uh, Python. So uh, just to illustrate that, I will uh, st.write the values stored by select date. Um, and what comes out is the, uh, the date that's selected here and the date that's selected here as a, a tuple type, which is a list in, or a type of list in Python. Um, so then I'm using the dot loc method of uh, Python data frames to filter the data set to the date range that's been selected here. So uh, I'll just uh, modify this a little bit so it's a little clearer um, that there are some changes. Uh, and what this is doing here is comparing dates in the month column to the first selected date, comparing dates in the month column to the second date, and then only returning rows in this data set that uh, return true for this comparison. Um, another type of filter you can use, uh, like Renuma showed, is a uh, select box. Um, so this is a select box that lets the user pick the trip type of um, rows in the data they want returned. So uh, a select box only returns one value and only lets you select one value. Um, and what I'm doing here is extracting unique values of trip type from the data set. Now, uh, another way to do this would be to just create, to write out in Python, a list of unique trip values like exp, lcl, slash, uh, ltd, et cetera. Um, that's a little less desirable than getting the unique values from the data set itself. Because if the data set changed, like if MTA came up with a new trip type that was somewhere between express and local, um, that might not be captured in the values that you've written out uh, directly. So generally, as a good practice, it's good to try to get the values of these filters from the data set. And we try to do that with the public site. Um, so uh, I feed in the values that are pulled from the data set using the unique and to list method to the select box here. Uh, index equals zero means the first option in this list is selected by default. Um, and what is returned from the select box is a string representing the value that's selected by the user. Um, and then again, as above, I'm filtering the data set to the uh, trip that type that's selected here. Um, I'm doing a similar thing for this uh, radio button, um, which is another streamlet input. It's basically the same as a select box, but instead of uh, a uh, sort of drop down list, it's a radio button. Um, and index equals one means the second option is selected. Um, zero is the default first option for Python. Uh, and then again, I'm filtering the data set to the period that's selected here. Um, in the next step, uh, there's a multi-select um, streamlet uh, user input option. This lets you select uh, multiple values. It also lets you select no values. So if I uh, selected nothing here, um, the page breaks below because it requires some selection. Um, and uh, what it returns is a list of the values that the user selects. Um, so uh, I've extracted the unique burrows. Those are the available options. Um, and uh, because it's a list that's being returned when I am filtering the data set, instead of using the sort of normal equals operators I was using before, uh, I'm using the isIn method of um, Python uh, series um, to do that comparison. So that just checks is the burrow that is in a given row of the bus journey data in the list of values that uh, are in um, select burrow. Uh, and um, then as part of the, the sort of final step of this, I'm creating another multi-select, or actually not quite the final step, but I'm creating another multi-select um, that allows the users to select which routes they want visualized in the data set here, in the chart here, and in the bar chart here. Um, so uh, one reason why 
uh, we've been applying filters to the data set at each step in this rather than all at the end. Like another way to write this would be to have as the final step bus journey equals bus journey dot loc and then apply all of the filters at once. One reason why it's good to do it sequentially is that routes that show up here are only routes that are still in the data set after these other filters have been applied. So if you hadn't done that and did it all at the end, you might pick routes that are excluded because, or routes that are only in Staten Island, for instance, or only in Queens and are filtered out by the data set. But we, we so it becomes unclear exactly uh, why you're getting an empty data set uh, un unless you're doing it sort of sequentially. So um, I'll select a few other routes here, um, and maybe some Manhattan routes. Um, OK. And then we have uh, three filters here that affect the visualizations uh, below, which I'll get more into in a bit. Um, the first is picking the metric. Um, this is using a uh, st.select box filter. Um, so if you pick additional travel time, the visualization uh, changes to reflect um, the metric that you've selected. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to that more as when, my, when I get to the uh, charts later. The last, or this next filter is a st.slider which uh, is a slider that lets you select from a range of values. So the value that is put as the default point here and the minimum here is the minimum value of the metric that you've selected here. So I've selected a number of customers. So the minimum number of customers on a given route that I've selected above uh, in a given month is 9,066. The maximum is... Um, 153,224. Uh, if I change this to additional bus stop time, the slider adjusts to uh, 0 0.64 to 3.53. I'll go back to a number of customers for now. Um, and you can uh, sort of play around with this, and it'll filter the data set based on uh, the your selection because of this LOC statement. Um, finally, there's a text input. Uh, which um, will determine the title of this bar chart. Uh, so I'll write number of customers by borough and borough or something. And then uh, if I hit enter, um, it uh, just displays there. Um, okay. So uh, there are, I guess the sort of next task we'll get to uh, is how we can organize this uh, sort of array of filters and um, these different visualizations in a more uh, structured way than uh, just all straight down. Like if I uh, expand this browser, um, it's not a great experience for the user of this web page. So uh, we'll use three streamlet functions right now. Um, the first is st.columns, which creates uh, columns to organize your page. The second is uh, st.expander, which um, is uh, somewhat self-explanatory, but will be more clear when it's used. And the third is st.tabs, which creates tabs that users can navigate between. Um, so starting from the top, uh, I'll create two columns using st.columns. Um, and I'll write two here. Uh, an alternative, um, you could write a list here and then specify the size of each column you're creating. So if I do one and two, that means the second column is twice as big as the first column. Um, but for now, I'll do two equal size columns. Uh, so this uh, initializes the creation of the column, but nothing is put uh, under them. To do that, it's uh, also pretty straightforward. You just type with and then the column number, and then anything you indent under that appears under that column. So I'll put uh, three of these filters under that column. And now all of these are on, uh, I guess I'll rerun it just to illustrate that. Um, so now those three filters are all in one column. 
um, then uh, this is like a more awkward layout, if anything. So I'll write with column two and then put the rest of the filters under that column and rerunning. OK, so now this is a little better, but there's still these hanging three metrics. And uh, honestly, these might not be relevant to our user. They might not be as interested in them. So, And they're also all related to the visualizations, not the data frame. So we might want to put these under an expander that people can only see if they want to uh, look at them individually. So to do that, uh, you can use the sc.expander function. Um, all you have to do to activate that is type with st.expander um, visualization fields selectors and then anything you tab under that will be under the expander so uh, now if I click that they appear if not they're hidden but the values are still there regardless of whether you display them or you uh, show them or not so finally, uh, the task is to organize um, these remaining visualizations. So for that, I'll use the st.tabs uh, function. So tab two, tab three equals st.tabs. And so uh, this is similar to st.columns, but instead of just giving a number, you give a list of the names of the tabs. So uh, data frame, line, chart, bar chart. And then uh, similar to with sd.com, with tab one, with tab two, with tab three. And I want the download button to be at the, which is still here, at the bottom of all of them. So I will leave it outside of the indents. So I'll refresh the page. Now I can flip between the data frame, the bar chart, and the line chart. Um, and download data still appears below it. So uh, now from a user perspective, this is a more organized way of uh, sort of going through this page. Um, it's not sort of all appearing at you at once. Um, where you want to access different information is a little more apparent. And uh, it's a little uh, better in that way. Um, there are still some issues with the page, um, namely that the line chart um, is not working clearly, um, and the bar chart uh, also has some issues. So uh, we'll start with the line chart. Um, so in this type of instance, it can be helpful to um, use Streamlit, like uh, people who have some program experience might use something like uh, Jupyter Notebook, where um, I am a little confused what the problem is with this line chart. So I want to look at the data that's being fed into the line chart. Um, so I'll write st.dataframe bus journey. And I could just flip to this tab, but it's a little easier to see it right on top of each other. Um, so I see that each row is a month. Uh, there's a burrow, there's a trip type, and a root. Um, so when I and looking at this, uh, the x-axis is the month, the y-axis is the metric I've selected, um, but root is just appearing multiple times at each point in this line because there are multiple roots per month. So I need to find some way of handling the root. Um, and what I'm, uh, I guess I should also go into, I'm uh, here using um, the Altair package to create this chart. So uh, there's sort of a three-step process. And also, I realize I'm going through a lot of this quickly. The reference material uh, should hopefully be helpful in this. Um, and uh, these scripts are available on the GitHub, and the final page will be as well. Um, the Altair package has basically a three-step process for making visualizations. The first is to initialize a chart, which I'm doing here with alt.chart and the data set that I want visualized. The second is to use a mark some type of function. So here, that is mark line. Here, that is mark bar. And the third is to encode, uh, which basically map uh, values to the axes of that uh, chart. So here, uh, x is month. That's what appears here. 
Y is select metric. Number of customers is what I've selected um, here. Uh, and um, then I'm specifying some additional properties, uh, like the title using the dot properties uh, function. And I'm making it interactive using dot interactive. Um, interactivity isn't actually that helpful here, but uh, is a feature you can include. Um, and a nice thing about Altair charts is if you hit this buttons in the top right, you can uh, save this as a, a PNG or an SVG um, to uh, be able to access it later. Um, so going back to uh, fixing the problems with this chart, uh, basically the problem is this chart is graphing data for each month, but doesn't know how to handle the fact that there are individual roots in this. So the approach that we'll take for this chart is we'll add another uh, feature to the chart, which is uh, color. And we'll select for that uh, root ID. So now if I rerun the chart, it looks much clearer. It's comparing by month each, uh, each um, root uh, total customers against each other. And if I wanted to flip to a different metric, I can see uh, similarly a comparison of additional bus time between these different routes. Um, another feature you can do is you can specify options to uh, the mark function. So uh, here I'll do point equals true and rerun. And it becomes a little clearer at each point um, or where on the graph uh, each route uh, lies. So now uh, the sort of next task and final task will be to fix the bar chart. Um, so uh, here, if I, again, look at the, the data that's being fed into the bar chart, um, which is the uh, bus journey data, um, I see that each row is a month, a borough, a trip type, which we filtered to one. Um, there couldn't be multiple boroughs and a uh, route, which there are multiple of. Um, the x-axis is borough, and the y-axis is, uh, in this case, additional bus stop time. So um, there isn't a clear handling of the fact that there are multiple months, and there are multiple routes being uh, combined into these individual bars. Um, so uh, here is a case where you might want to use um, sort of uh, different handling for different metrics. So let's say I wanted to know the total um, custom or total uh, riders of these buses uh, by these boroughs uh, over time. I could do um, aggregate equals sum and then rerun. Okay, and now this is a clear handling of uh, this chart. Uh, it's totaling the number of uh, riders in each month by borough um, for the date range I've selected for the trip type and the period you've selected. Um, if you wanted, uh, if we did something or a different metric though, like additional bus stop time, um, summing would not be an appropriate way to handle that necessarily um, because that's showing, or it wouldn't be because it's showing the average additional travel time per route um, by month. So adding that together isn't showing you meaningful information. Uh, a more informative metric might be the mean. Um, so to see by borough for the routes you've selected, the mean additional travel time uh, for those months. Um, and I think that worked, but it looks the same as the other chart. So. I'm uh, a little confused, but, um, and then uh, in this sort of last, and, and I guess I should also go over with alt.x and alt.y, you have the option of specifying more uh, sort of specific parameters for the fields, like the type of data or whether to aggregate it or not. Um, then you do, uh, if you just give the name of the variable and then with the tooltip uh, parameter, you're able to, with the alt.tooltip function, create uh, tooltips that hover or show when you hover over the data. Um, so uh, I think the very 
very last uh, step I'll go over before opening to questions is um, you may, uh, for the reason we went, or some of the reasons we went over, uh, want to use um, sort of uh, conditional logic to make your web pages. So if they select, if the user selects number of customers, maybe you want um, the uh, values to be summed together. If they select uh, mean, or if they select another metric, maybe you want them to be averaged. Uh, to resolve that, you can use um, if else statements. So uh, those are uh, fairly straightforward to use. If um, metric select metric equals number of customers, I'll create a new variable called aggregate equals sum else aggregate equals mean. And then I'll and replace the text here with the variable I've defined there. So now um, if, I, if the user selects number of customers, it uh, should total them up. Um, if they select a different metric, it should uh, calculate the average. Um, OK. so. We've gone from a fairly disorganized page to a more organized one and tried to resolve some of the problems with these charts. Uh, I think um, that is pretty much everything I meant to cover. So I, I think uh, should have some time for uh, any remaining questions. Yeah, and I think we have some questions in the chat. So maybe I'll pass a few of those over to you. Um, so one of them is about how to, I think, change the color scheme on the charts. I don't know if you're prepared to talk about that. <laughs> um, I think so. Uh, it, I guess, this is a thing where, uh, like, it's helpful to. Well, let me. A, a useful thing about VS Code and other. Um, sort of uh, IDEs is um, that they uh, have help um, and like pop-up text. So if I type um, alt.chart.code, uh, yeah, this is not as helpful as I was hoping because um, it hasn't loaded yet. I mean, I think the short answer, right, is that we can change the color scheme to whatever we want. And if you notice what Dan built here, you can see that the colors used are different than what we have on our metric site, which we defined specific color codes that we wanted throughout the charts. So yes, it's definitely possible. And maybe in the updated script that we share to the GitHub, we can add that as a sample to a line chart or something. Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Um, okay, then a question from another Dan, uh, and then we might have to, that might be the last question for now, is if we could talk briefly about what it takes to go from this example to the actual live dashboard. Are the data loaded in a similar way, and are the stream of objects just embedded in those pages? So maybe I'll start, and Dan and Renuma or anyone on the team, if you want to plug in. So yeah, this is exactly how we have built metrics.mta. Info. We do have a few other packages used to support it, but this is how you we load the data in. We pull as much of it as we can from the New York State Open Data Portal, with the goal being that hopefully by the end of this year, everything you see on the site is data that you can view yourself, manipulate yourself using it from open data. Um, so yeah, we have the same loading data type of functions, similar line charts you'll see. Um, and I would love to eventually make the entire site open source. We're not quite there yet and need a bit of cleaning up to do before that happens. But I'm hoping that this session gives you a sense of kind of what's going on behind the scenes for that site. Uh, and the whole thing is built as a Streamlit app, not just Streamlit objects embedded in the page. Like the entire thing is through Streamlit. Dan, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, nope. Okay, uh, great. I think that covers everything then that we wanted to. So yeah, I think that Dan can save a copy of these edits that he's made to this page and we'll upload that to the GitHub. Um, you can always contact us at opendata at 
ntahq.org if you have questions, comments about our open data program, about our visuals. And big shout out to Dan and Renuma for putting together this session. I learned a lot from it as someone who's constantly learning to become a better programmer, and I hope you guys did too.